Welcome to our YouTube Live everyone. I'm a little bit early tonight for a change. Um, so this is really just to summarise what the Bank of England did today at their monetary policy meeting and talk through some of the reasons behind what they did but also some of the consequences which uh, they've actually mentioned themselves but also uh, what happened to markets after they made their announcement which wasn't a lot to be fair. But let me start off with the decision. So they decided to keep monetary policy fixed, just like the Fed did yesterday. And um, it's got to be said that uh, it seems like this is the end of the rate hiking cycle for now, given that the Fed's not done anything for two meetings now and the Bank of England hasn't done anything for two meetings. But still, uh, they're a little bit more pessimistic, I'd say, for the UK outlook. We'll talk about this in detail too in a moment. And how would I summarise what they said? I think I think they're pretty clear that there's still upside risk to inflation and that means that they're going to be cautious for longer. So if you're expecting interest rates to come down a lot, you're going to be disappointed. So that's the kind of very short summary of, of, of what they said. And we'll dig into the, some of the reasons and some of the data behind it in just a moment. Um, let me just mention also that we're doing this live stream tonight. It's the second successive one I've done after the Fed. But we're going to move our normal first Thursday of the month live Q&A until next Thursday. So that's going to be the 9th of November. Normally we'd have had it on the 2nd of November. Um, so anyway, that, that just gets bumped back um, for one week until 9th of November. And that's going to be at 7pm UK time. Also, if you're interested in how to actually implement some of this stuff, how to actually invest on the back of it. I'll be doing a seminar, a live online seminar in collaboration with C-Bonds, which is a provider of bond data, very extensive bond data, I have to say. And that'll be, um, that'll be in November as well, later this month. And if you want to find out about that and register for it, because you have to register it for it beforehand, there'll be a link in the description of this video. And I'll be tweeting about it later as well. And the title of that seminar is Money Market Funds or Government Bonds, which is best? Because, of course, if you think you're going to lock in rates for longer, if you want to lock, lock in rates for longer, you'd go for a government bond. If you think interest rates are still increasing, you'd go for a money market fund. Or perhaps if you think interest rates are going to stay high for a long period of time, which is, based on what the Bank of England said today, looking quite likely. But I don't think it's a trivial choice between the two. And I think that'll be probably quite an interesting webinar if you're worried about how to actually implement some of this stuff. But also to help you form your own opinion about what's going to happen. It's not my job to tell you what's going to happen. This is really just to inform you, educate you, so that you can make more sense of monetary policy and also how to act on it based on your own opinions. So let me just go back now to what, I, what actually happened today after all of that. So... Let's share screen and I shall appear small in the corner. Good. There we are. Oh, and I should have said Teddy will appear later while we wait for you to think of some questions. There will be questions at the end and you can make chats, of course, as we go along if you're a subscriber to our channel. And of course, super chats get pushed to the front of the queue, as do supporters of our of our channel on YouTube. So this is the tweet that came out after the Bank of England's decision. This was at lunchtime today. Again, it wasn't a unanimous decision from the Bank of England. The Monetary Policy Committee has nine members and they voted 6-3 to keep rates where they are. The other three votes would have been, I suspect, to increase rates. And personally, I think they were probably right to think that. But let's let's look through the numbers before we make any premature judgments. Um, so bank rate currently 5.25%. That's where we are now. And they think that higher rates are now working. They can see the effect on the economy. It is having a negative effect on demand and the wage market, the, the labour market is getting less tight. And again, we'll dig into that in a moment. Inflation has fallen, clearly, and they expect it to fall more this year and to fall more next year. Of course, falling rate, a falling rate of inflation does not mean prices are falling. It just means that they're rising less quickly. So that's called 
disinflation. It's not deflation, which is when prices are falling year on year. So for a falling rate of inflation is what we're seeing. A lot of that, of course, is due to energy, as we'll see. But they're going to keep interest rates high enough for long enough to get inflation back to their 2% target. So they're just preparing the way for people not to be upset if rates stay high for a long time. So don't be surprised if that's the case. This is their forecast. The, 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 sorry, this is the Monetary Policy Report history of the Bank of England bank rate. And we'll see more history in a moment going back over 300 years. But you can see how aggressive these rate hikes have been, how very rapid it's been to go from zero effectively all the way up to five and a quarter percent. So very rapid increases. Some of those increases were 0.75 percent in one meeting, which is very unusual, particularly for the Bank of England. But it's gone up a long way and now the cost of borrowing is much higher. So things which are sensitive to the cost of borrowing, things like corporate bonds, you know, if, if companies have to borrow in the in the bond market, that's become more expensive. Bank loans more expensive. And of course, mortgages more expensive is what most people are sensitive to. On the upside, savings are higher. So if you have a money market fund, you can earn a pretty good rate of return above 5%, usually for many of the money market funds, simply by parking your money in a very, very, very safe fund with almost no volatility. So that's the upside of higher rates. Good for savers, bad for borrowers. But the overall effect, according to the Bank of England, and their hope is that this will reduce economic activity and reduce inflation indirectly because of that. If we look at their inflation decomposition, so these are the components of inflation. You can see petrol prices here in orange. I am colorblind, so I'm kind of guessing here, but I think that's orange. Food is the kind of blue bars on the top. You can see the effect of petrol prices has diminished such that by summertime this year, it was a very small con contributor to inflation. Whereas um, other goods down at the bottom here, which includes services, as we'll see, that's still pretty chunky. So energy inflation has subsided, but services inflation is still high and food inflation is still high and will decompose inflation in a bit more granular fashion later on. But anyway, they expect inflation to carry on falling. These, um, these, the kind of shaded bit here is their forecast. So they just extrapolate this line effectively such that by the third print from now, it's gonna be less than 6%. So let's hope they're right. This is the actual year on year forecast for the end of 2023, the end of 2024 and the end of 2025. The horizontal line you can see here is the Bank of England's target. That's what they're aiming for. And you can see it'll take until the end of 2025 for us to get there. So we have another two years to go until they get to where they want to be. And this is their forecast. So long way to go and interest rates will probably be very high until we get there or you know, until we're pretty close to that um, achieving that goal. So as I said, I said that we look at the kind of longer term Bank of England bank rate. This is their monetary policy rate. The bit we've seen recently where it kind of goes crazy up to five and a quarter percent is a tiny proportion of this overall time since the bank's been around in 1694 is when it was founded. But what I'm trying to show here is how often the bank rate has been at close to five percent. You can see that's the kind of default setting and has been for that 350 year period, 340 year period, 30 year period. So that's completely normal. So really when people are worried that the bank rate's very high, in fact, this is just normal. And you know there was just an unusually low rate period which preceded this because of the global financial crisis and then the COVID pandemic. So really we're just going back to normal. And if you want to see how aggressive those rate hikes were, you can see these huge jumps. A 50 basis point increase is very unusual. Usually central banks increase 0.25% at a time or 25 basis points. But you had lots of 50 basis point increases, 175, then an, I think there was more than 175, evidently not. Um, but yeah, there was 1.75% increase, which is really unusual. 
So the Bank of England's really racing to get to a tight monetary policy to try and squeeze inflation back to reasonable levels. So let's look at inflation just to see how we're doing, because it's a long journey. It has been a long journey. And as we'll find out in a moment, they think there's quite a bit of that journey left to travel. So this is CPI inflation. This is consumer price inflation based on a standardized basket of goods and services, which changes all the time based on our consumption habits. Headline CPI inflation, which includes everything, all of the components, that's rising at about 6.6% at the moment, year on year. So still very high, still way above the target, which is the 2% dashed red line you can see here. And it's been that way for over two years. Core inflation is more interesting to the bank because that strips out the bits they can't control and which are very volatile, which is energy. That's not under their control. Um, oil prices don't respond to higher interest rates, of course. Uh, food prices as well are stripped out. Also tobacco in the UK, although that's less of an issue. Uh, it's less important as a, as, a, as a form of consumption in the UK, but it's still stripped. So that's less volatile. You can see it's less fluctuates less, but it's a better predictor of future inflation. So the central bank pays a lot of attention to core CPI. And that has fallen a bit, but you can see it hasn't fallen a lot from its peak, which um, was, I think, around 7% at its peak. So still very high core inflation, not really coming down much. Headline inflation has been dragged down by energy prices, although those have started going up again. So if we break it down into contributions to that 12-month inflation rate, we can see what's generating it. Food, as you can see, and we saw that in the Bank of England's graph as well, is now the biggest contributor, food and non-alcoholic beverages. So here we go. It's my Coke, which I was drinking. Gone up in price. And restaurants and hotels, they're having to pay high energy prices. They've still got the aftermath of the huge energy spike that we had previously. Restaurants and hotel prices still uh, rising year on year. Housing and household services still up 1.06% year on year, recreation and culture. The thing to notice here is none of these components are negative. Previously, transport was negative last month as a contributor, but because energy prices have gone up a bit again, up a bit again, that's gone back into slightly positive territory. But no negative components yet. If we look at the contributions to the CPI rate between August and September, so this isn't year on year changes. These are the contributions to the change between August and September. So this shows you the short term changes. Transport, you can see, I said energy prices had risen. That's actually one of the biggest contributors. It is the biggest contributor to the tick upwards in September. The things which are pulling inflation down are food and non-alcoholic beverages, which are now starting to fall, furniture and household goods, and miscellaneous goods and services. But you can see that there are still more components pushing up than down on a monthly basis. So still not looking great, I have to say. And if we compare the UK with other countries, other developed countries, you can see that we're still leading not, it's not a good thing. We're leading the world in terms of inflation, uh, certainly amongst these developed market um, comparable type countries. We're above the EU average, the EU 27 average, which is 5.9. We're above France. We're well above France. And we're way above Germany and miles above uh, the US using a comparable inflation measure called Hiccup. So still not out of the woods yet. So now let's just briefly touch on the press conference. I had to watch it. I had to make notes. So you're going to have to listen to my summary. Uh, but it is quite interesting because you actually hear a little bit of the nuance. And the journalists, if they're good, dig into the report, which they probably read before they arrive there, maybe on the tube on the way there. And they hopefully dig into some of the cracks in the report. So just to summarise what I, I took from it. Firstly, they think policy is sufficiently restrictive. A big part of the conversation yesterday at the Fed's meeting was, where are we? Have we got a sufficiently restrictive policy? 
And the Fed still doesn't know whether that's the case. That's what the question they're trying to answer. And then once they've asked, answered that question, they'll say, how long should we keep it at this restrictive rate? And they still haven't answered that question yet. So, but just like the Fed, no one in the Monetary Policy Committee was talking about cutting rates yet. No one. So that is just not part of the conversation yet. How do they know pol policy sufficiently restrictive? Well, they can see weaker demand for goods and services in the UK. The labour market softened, and we'll see the data for that in a sec. Now, somebody asked, so what is the rate which is neutral? When things are normal, what will we go back to? And they kind of, they said, well, we don't know, which is fair, because you don't know what the neutral rate is. We know that we're currently at five point five and a quarter percent we know that it must be less than five and a quarter percent because they can see the negative effect on the economy so they know they've gone above it but nobody knows what that rate is at which it started having a negative effect another complication of course is that it takes a long time for monetary policy to affect the economy it's like pulling an elephant on on roller skates it takes a long time for the elephant to accelerate and similarly, monetary policy has a huge lag. So it's difficult to know what that neutral rate is, but certainly the Bank of England, the Monetary Policy Committee, thinks we're currently above it. Inflation risk, they think, is skewed to the upside. So they always talk about modal forecasts. That just means the most likely path. And we'll see the fan charts in a moment, which predict based on some uncertainty bands. So the modal path is the most likely. Then you have upside risk, downside risk. But they always talk about the skew of risks because really it's about balancing risks when you set monetary policy. Raise too aggressively and you crush the economy and increase unemployment and slow down growth. Increase too slowly and inflation just gets out of control. And they've got to somehow tread between those two very unpleasant outcomes. What they're saying is if inflation is skewed to the upside in their expectation, they're willing to step more heavily on growth and that means more unemployed people. That's the gist of it. That's the painful consequence. They're willing to do that because they think the risk for inflation is still skewed to the upside. That might mean another rate increase, but it certainly means that rates will stay high for a long period of time now because they still may not have done enough according to their, their expectations and their reading of the economy. Wage growth was kind of interesting because they showed this really fuzzy graph. I say it's fuzzy because it's got lots of different estimates from different um, sources of information. It had the ONS data, it had various surveys. Wage growth is still too high. Whatever line you take, it's too high to be consistent with 2% inflation. So they've got to get wage growth down if they want to get inflation back to 2%. And that's going to be painful and it means job losses, and it means weaker growth. And, if, and the growth as well, they think, is still is currently running below its um, potential. So weak growth is, 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 is already what we're seeing, but it's not sufficiently weak, they think, to reduce activity enough to get inflation down to 2%, unless wages start, wage growth starts to slow. And the really important point was that they, they've done various bits of research, their staff at the Bank of England have done huge amounts of research, and they think we're about halfway through this tightening period. The GDP effect, they think, will be close to fully felt by 2025. So let's just dig into that paragraph, because I think this is probably the most important paragraph. Let's just do a build there, because um, I think we should just break that down. This is great, doing slides on the... Um, on the fly. So you'd see my creation process here. <laughs> so I just didn't want to confuse it with too much text. So the impact of higher interest rates on GDP is expected to materialise with a significant lag. Of course, they always say that there's a lag because, for example, with mortgages, if you've got a two year, five year mortgage, then it's going to take a while for those mortgages to roll off and have to be refinanced. Same for corporate bonds. So monetary policy, if you raise rates today, could take one year, two year, three years to have its effect. They think we're about halfway through. So that means that it's going to take 
until 2025, another two years at least, for the GDP impact to be close to fully felt. So that's not fully felt, close to fully felt. So it's going to be a long time. And based on the average relationships over the past um, between the bank rate, between bank rate, other financial instruments and economic activity, they think that more than half of the impact on the level of GDP, more than half, is still to come. So we're not even halfway there yet. So if we're the kids at the back of the car saying to Andrew Bailey, are we there yet, Dad? He's going to say, sorry, kids, we're not even halfway there yet. That's that's the gist of it. Um, but there is significant uncertainty around the estimate. So they're not absolutely sure, but we're still nowhere near there. The impact is likely to be felt more quickly on housing investment. Clearly, that's very interest rate sensitive and more slowly on consumption. So you're probably thinking, well, I went shopping this Saturday and there were still people in the shops. There are still people in restaurants. You know, it's OK. You know, I mean, there's not a problem. Well, then look at the housing market and you see the effect of, you know, some more restrictive policy on on housing is definitely happening now. Less mortgages being originated, uh, weaker house prices. You know, we've seen wage, we've seen house prices start to fall, and uh, it's likely that consumption will also be affected. So that's going to be bad news for shops, for retail, for leisure activities. You know, cinemas, pubs. Um, so. It's just it's taking longer to reach that part of the economy, but it's coming. So that, I think that's the kind of most important thing. It's the fact that we're halfway there and there's a long way to go. Let's just quickly look at the uh, monetary policy report, because this is one of the things that they've published for this um, this announcement. And they don't do this every meeting. And when they don't have this MPC report, monetary policy report, they don't have a press brief, press um, meeting, uh, press conference. So anyway, today they did have a press conference and it's there to watch on YouTube if you're interested afterwards, if you're really into this. But this is the summary of their forecast. So all the big indicators which they forecast are here. The numbers in parentheses are what they forecast in their August monetary policy report. So you can see how their expectations have changed. Now, in August, they expected growth to be higher than it is now. Um, now they're expecting the end of this year, GDP will be around 0.6%. So just a shade above recession. 2024, pretty much no growth at all. None. Uh, and that was a revision down by 0.1%, 0.1 percentage points. And then by 2025, are we going to recover? No. It's still going to be almost no GDP growth. Only by the time we get to 2026 is there going to be some sniff of recovery. For a developed market economy, you'd expect 25 3% growth to be okay, maybe 2%, but we're not going to be there for some time, for three years. So that's not a great look, and it's not great for the UK. Modal inflation, CPI inflation is going to be the most likely path of inflation according to all of their conditioning variables like the price of oil, the price of gas. That's very important for the UK. Based on their forecast for those variables, this is what is most likely. So 4.6% by the end of this year, which is lower than they expected in August. 3.1% at the end of 2024. 1.9%, which is below target uh, by the end of 2025. So at that point, they'll have reached their target and they think it'll overshoot a little bit. So by the end of 2026, it'll be 1.5. So they think the job will be done in about two years, their job. And then the unemployment rate, remember, just a 0.1% percentage point increase in this means hundreds of thousands of people losing their jobs. So don't be put off by the fact it's a dry number. This is real human suffering we're seeing here. So that's going from 4.3% at the end of this year to 5% at the end of 2025. And then at the end of 2026, it gets higher still. So not great, but that's what it'll take, they think, to get inflation down. And then bank rate, they're going to have it at 5.3% by the end of this year, 
5.1 percent at the end of 2024 4.5 at the end of q4 2025 and even at the end of 2026 it'll be at 4.2 so of course mortgages will also stay high while that remains elevated and that'll be the case for some time if we look at their growth projection you can see the fact that it's flatlining here for a very long time and there's very little sign of life even by the end of their outlook period which is three years there is there's a chance it could be as high as five percent there's a chance it could be as low as minus two and a half but still that looks pretty atrocious if we look at the wage growth forecast let me just turn this off someone very ha happily uh, spamming me there we go um, and you can see this they have a range of models which do the forecast and the November monetary policy report is actually saying that inf wage growth is going to stay high for longer than their models were previously forecasting so high wages remember push up services inflation and that's not good so that's going to make inflation stickier and probably extends out their forecast for high inflation and then if we look at the unemployment rate you can see that worst case we go up to about eight percent at the end of 2026 best case it starts falling to about two percent at the end of 2026 but most likely it rises to about five percent at the end of this forecast period so not great if you're just a normal person trying to make a wage what's also interesting is they have two forecasts for inflation the top one is based on what markets think is going to happen to interest rates and markets expect that the bank of england will cut rates next year if we're if instead over this entire three-year period you keep rates at 5.25 percent so they don't lower rates at all for three years you get the bottom forecast and what's kind of interesting is there's hardly any difference to the inflation forecast okay in this forecast it's a little bit lower at the end of the period but not by much and that was something that the journalists commented on and also uh, ben Broadbent, Broadbent commented on there isn't a huge difference between them so yeah i think even if they do start to even if they do keep rates high for longer because of the fact that you have these lags perhaps and because we've already had some effect on on activity it's not going to make that much difference if we suddenly reduce our breaking effect uh, by lowering interest rates now but it's not going to be a big in, big big cut to interest rates so that's probably why there's not a lot of difference so let's look at pay growth because that's kind of interesting as a driver of inflation if we go back to 2020 before 2020 you can see that wage growth was around two three percent that was normal then we had a dip in wages we they actually fell year on year during the pandemic and then we had this huge spike in wages which is continuing and the current level of pay growth is incredibly high it's 8.1 percent the good news is that it's above inflation so it's a real wage growth people are seeing more money in their pockets but if you are a working family with a mortgage what's being given by higher wages is being taken away by that higher cost of borrowing if you haven't got a mortgage then you're in really good shape but that doesn't affect everybody and a third of households in the uk have a mortgage about a th more than a third actually live completely without any mortgage at all so they're not really affected by interest rates but for the third which are working with mortgages it's still painful if we look at real wage growth if we take away inflation from the rate of pay increase notice how it's been kind of oscillating between positive and negative for a long time in the uk with negative wage growth for extended periods of time after the global financial crisis before the financial crisis we had reasonable wage growth and region reasonable productivity growth people per hour were making more stuff but that stopped being the case after the pandemic P productivity ground to a halt wage growth ground to a halt and started going in reverse and it's only recently that that's kind of gone back into positive territory 
And that's why if you actually compare the level of wages, weekly average, average weekly earnings, we're about where we were in 2000 and when was that 2007. So really, there's been no wage growth in real terms in the UK for over a decade. And that's a huge problem for the UK economy. If we look at goods and services, one of the points they were making in the uh, monetary policy meeting today was that service inflation is staying sticky. That's the yellow line. Whereas goods inflation spiked hugely, but that is falling much more quickly. So that's something which they expect to continue. Services inflation will stay high and goods inflation will fall. And services inflation, services will be things like lawyers, um, hairdressers, you know, all of the things that we pay for a, a big part of the UK economy. That is driven by wages, wage growth. So that's why they've got to get wage growth under control. And the tight labour market is to blame, right? So we've got low unemployment in the UK, 4.3%. By historic standards, that's incredibly low. And if we look at the number of vacancies, the number of job vacancies per person who's unemployed, there are quite a few. So despite having some unemployed people, there are still lots of jobs out there which perhaps they're not qualified to fill. But for whatever reason, the labour market's still looking very tight compared to where we were before the pandemic. So normal is over here and we're only just about falling back to normal. So monetary policy is having an effect. It has fallen. The labour market is slackening, as they say, but it's still not to where you'd want it to be. And that's probably why wage inflation is still high. Uh, so what are the consequences of all this? Well, firstly, mortgage rates are still high. So if you look at uh, two year fixed mortgages rates in the UK, if you've got 95 percent loan to value, so you're borrowing 95 percent of the value of the house, you're paying around 6.8% still. If you're only borrowing 60%, then 5.9%. So those are coming down. We've gone past the peak, but it's taking a long time to do that. And if you're coming off your fixed rate period, this is probably cold comfort. If we look at the strength of sterling today as the Bank of England made its announcement, there was a bit of an increase at 12 p.m., as the announcement came out, but you can see very quickly that faded. So there hasn't been a huge effect on sterling as a result of that policy announcement today. And the biggie, I think, is oil. Because remember what stopped inflation in its tracks was when oil, um, what kicked everything off was when oil spiked and when gas prices spiked. And what we've seen recently is that oil started rising again. Fortunately, it has fallen back to about $86 a barrel. But remember that OPEC plus, they wanted to be at around 100 a barrel. And one of the things that was discussed today was the war in Israel between Israel and Hamas and whether that's going to spill into a broader conflict which could threaten supply. If that happens, of course, we could have a secondary spike in inflation driven by higher energy. So that's one of the risks which the Bank of England's baking into its upside skew forecast for inflation. So let's stop it there and I'll, I'll hand it over to you for questions. I'll get my puppy upstairs uh, for his treats. He refused my uh, low fat treats yesterday, but he didn't refuse the buffalo treats. He likes those. So I'll see if I can summon, summon him up from downstairs. And yeah, so if you do have a question, think of it, ask it. Uh, put it into chat. Please do a super chat because it helps us immensely. And uh, pity the poor chap yesterday who uh, mistakenly gave us a hundred pounds for a super chat. You know that's probably too generous. Okay, <laughs> but if you do do a super chat, obviously it gives us a bit of money, and uh, that helps us. And if you're one of our supporters on YouTube as well, we'll push you to the front of the queue. Oh, here he comes. Oh, hello. Come on in. Would you like a treat, young man? Oh. Oh. Don't want to be too close to that. Can I put it over here? Yes. They can't see you. Go over there and then come up here. That's it. I can see that face. Good boy. Very good. Oh, 
very good. There we are, Ted. Another one. Just one more. Yay. Good boy. Now I could offer him one of the low fat ones. And you see, he doesn't like these. I suppose if, if it's got fat in it, it makes it tastier. Is that right? Will you? You're not going to eat that, are you? He's gonna oh yeah good boy he did last night he spurned it. i think that's because laura was rattling the um, treat bowl downstairs and she's got biltong which he loves do you want to go back downstairs people have probably thought some questions here how are we doing for questions um yes Do we have some questions? Yes, we do. Right. Uh, hi from Hedge Fund. Someone is saying ramen. Yeah, very good. With a bowl of ramens as a as a as a kind of emoji. Yeah, it's funny if, if you have Americans. I always explain my name. My first name is Ramen, and I always say it's like ramen. You know, because that's how they pronounce my name, ramen. So I say it's like the noodles. Um, yeah, please do like and share. Good point, Laura. Um, oh, interesting question. Nags121 is saying, when, when saving interest going to increase? That was one of the things which they discussed today. I'll see if I can pull up the, uh, the graph from the report. Um, savings here we go pass through to savings rates yeah oh no is that it no savings rates oh, i definitely had a graph of it which i was looking at today savings rates mortgage rates Oh, is that it? Yes. Here we go. Let me share. So this, this is the actual report, the MPC report from today. And it's graph 2.6. 2 and you can see that the bank rate is the orange line here. Bank rate is at 5.25. Instant access deposit accounts took a long time, but they finally actually increased to something like 3%. So half of that, a little bit more than half, is now being fed through to, to customers of banks for instant access deposits. Fixed rate savings bonds, it has to be said, have increased in line with bank rate much more quickly. But of course, for those, the bank isn't so worried about people pulling out their money. For instant access deposits, it's a big risk to the bank because they call that runnable money. If you have a run on your bank, that's the money that flows out. The money that's fixed for a fixed period of time can't be taken out without a penalty. So uh, that's less risky to the bank. So they're willing to pay you a higher rate for that. But instant access money, site deposits as they're called, usually you get a much worse rate on that on purpose. But it is starting to feed through because of the FCA's action plan on cash savings, which was a which was a policy action from the Financial Conduct Authority to try and get more transmission of higher rates to people's bank accounts. But it took the regulator to prod banks in order to get it to happen. Still, it is starting to happen in answer to your question. And back to me. Yeah, 14 point action plan from the FCA. Nice that. And back to your questions. How are we doing? Oh, we've got a super chat. Oh, nine nine pounds ninety nine super chat, not ten pounds. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. It wasn't a hundred pounds. The funny thing was, <laughs> I'll tell you what happened yesterday. Well, thank you. It was Amir Ketov Chi. Thank you very much, Amir. Um, the funny thing was, the chap yesterday gave us a hundred pounds by mistake. 
and uh, he actually said, I'm sorry, it was a mistake. I meant for it to be £10. But of course, YouTube takes some ridiculous amount. I think it's like 30, 38% is what they take. So by the time they take in the money and we give it back to him, there's a round trip where they make their money, but both of us lose out. So anyway, uh, Laura very kindly gave him a free membership of our community as a result. So I hope that doesn't start a trend. But look, yeah, very generous. Anyway, thank you, Amir. I really appreciate it. He says, just a high five of support. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Anyway, um, back to your questions. Uh, let's see what we've got here. Um, oh, Tasty Pimp. You've just got such a good name. I have to read your qu your question. What's interesting to observe is that rates dropped suddenly in response to the GFC and stayed very low for a long time. True. So perhaps we really need to consider that more rates have increased rapidly. Rates could rates could stay higher for long. Rates could stay higher for years. Yeah, I think they probably will. I mean, even according to the Bank of England's forecast, they're going to stay high above four percent way out to 2026 so don't expect rates to go back to zero because they won't neutral rates they wouldn't be drawn on it but it's probably going to be what they go back to of course is neutral rate it's going to be something like i don't know three the federal reserve has its dot plots its summary of economic projections and their neutral rate i think was between two and a half to three percent and the bank of england will probably be similar Eddie Ward agrees. He says it's going to be higher than zero. And then Tasty Pimp replies, now rates have increased rapidly. They could stay high for years. Yeah. Uh, he thinks it's going to be around 5% for years. Well, certainly 5% for the next couple of years. Remember, that was the Bank of England's expectation. Let's go back to that forecast. Here we go. So this is what the Bank of England thinks, um, where it thinks rates are going to be. So bank rate, it thinks, is going to be 5.3% at the end of this year, 5.1% at the end of 2024 next year, and 45 at the end of 25, and still at 42 at the end of 26. And this is their central case, so it could be even higher. And if inflation is, if, if inflation risks are skewed to the upside, if we get another surge in the price of oil and gas, then yeah, it's going to be even higher higher than this central case anyway. So yeah, I think that is pretty much baked already into their forecast. Back to you. Uh, call CPI is a truer indicator of the impact of monetary policy, true. And then something about, oh, I like your videos. Oh, Wrecker12 says, like your videos. Thank you, Wrecker12. I appreciate it. 4 to 5% is a new normal. I think it would be a little bit lower than that once we go beyond that 2026 point. Um, how are we doing? I always quadruple check bank, bank transfers. Okay. <laughs> this is going back to the £100 super chat yesterday. Um, what else have we got? Yeah, please do ask a super chat if you want to ask a question. Um, Eddie Ward says he was trying to send a grand. Decimal point was a typo. Sadly not. <laughs> I almost choked on my Coca-Cola. Was it Fanta yesterday? There we go. A question from... Oh, an interesting question. Um, hello, Roman. Would a re UK recession be good for long term growth? Clear the dead wood. I think. I think it's possible that. Um, I guess once you have a cull of companies which have grown up on zombie money when interest rates were zero, once you wipe out the zombies, you could say that that's going to open up the space for new, more productive companies, which can survive with higher interest rates, which aren't zombie companies, which don't depend on debt to survive. 
So in a way, yeah, you know, after we've had zero interest rates for so long, there is a large number of companies, there are a large number of companies which depend on that low cost of funding. So maybe you do get leaner and meaner companies if you get that um, wipeout of all the zombies. The, the worry, I guess, is that you have some kind of hysteresis effect where people who've done a previous company get this sort of um, put off the idea of starting off again. You know, in America, for example, you often see people who are serial entrepreneurs. They fail once, but they learn from that and then they go on to do better with their next company. I think in the UK, there's less of that. I think if people fail once, there's a kind of shame about it still. And it's more difficult to go around and, you know, start up again. So perhaps there will be a kind of hysteresis effect and it'll stop people trying to start a new company. But yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it improved things. Interesting question, though. I mean, it is, a, it is an empirical question. I don't think you can answer that one um, convincingly. But I think after this zero interest rate period, I think personally that it would be good for growth. Um, it would certainly be good for inflation. It would certainly get it down. Uh, question from Andrew Alonzi. This may be a silly question. Given rates in the US and UK are roughly comparable, why are yields on the US Treasury one year so much higher than on the UK gilt one year? Well, if it's anything to go by, all of the pension crafters have been piling into that short term interest rate. Uh, so maybe, maybe that's what's pushed down the yields at the short end of the curve for the UK. Maybe that's the case. Um, certainly for the Bank of England, I think people are now expecting that because growth here is weaker, they can't be as aggressive with the bank rate, with bank rate, not the bank rate, with bank rate, whereas the Fed can, because growth there is much stronger. Their economy is much more resilient. Their labour market's much more resilient. And I think they probably could weather higher interest rates for longer. The fear is in the UK that they're going to crush what very little growth we've got. Remember the forecast for GDP was just on the cusp of recession. And um, Ben Broadbent today was making a big deal about, oh, yeah, well, whether it's slightly above zero or below zero is not going to make a big difference. But whatever, you look, however you look at it, it's an atrocious growth forecast for a very long period of time. So I think, yeah, that's that's pretty awful. Um, but, but I think that's why rates here are going to be lower on the expectation that the Bank of England can't be as aggressive, whereas the Fed can and probably has to be. And the Fed's still flirting with another rate hike. The Bank of England, I think, would have a very difficult time justifying that, given its effect on growth. Um, what else have we got? Have we got any more Super Chats? Nope. OK, well, I think we'll probably uh, draw a line under that now. So don't forget, we've got um, we've got a C-Bonds webinar if you want to learn about whether it's best to have a money market fund, feed off that short end of the curve, or lock in a rate for longer on the back of all this monetary policy stuff. Uh, and that'll be the topic. It's called Money Market Funds or Government Bonds, which is best. You can register for that free in the link below. And that'll be in about two weeks' time. And that'll be entertaining, I promise, uh, if you enjoy our normal stuff. And uh, we've moved our normal live stream until 9th of November at 7 p.m. after I've had my supper. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you also um, for your very good questions, your comments. And don't forget that um, we've got um, a podcast as well. Many happy returns. If you enjoy this, you'll enjoy that with my very talented co-host Michael Pugh who uh, makes it entertaining and structures it and uh, is also very well informed himself now he probably knows more than I do now <laughs> after all he, he has to make all the notes for the podcasts but still uh, do listen to many happy returns and please do like subscribe it helps us a lot and we'll see you on November the 9th for another one of these live streams take care everyone